that Spain had changed the law allowing people to renounce Catholicism so they could get married civilly. So um, Luis went to the U.S. Consul in San Francisco. I, the first time I heard him speak Spanish and they were kind of yelling at each other, you young people don't know what you're doing. But anyway, <laughs> so that, that's how I got here. I had never been to Spain. I'd been to Europe three or four times. I wasn't rejecting Spain. It was just a bit farther, I think, also. And, but I, I was thinking it was sort of brave to come here, to live without having ever seen it. And and strip, what year was that? And it was 69, July. You know. yeah. Well, actually, we went straight to Ibiza to build a house with um, seven Catalan friends. So we still have that house many years later. Eight bedrooms. And Eight bedrooms? bedrooms. Did you yeah, say? each couple had their bedroom, and wow. then there's a common wow. area. And it's still standing up. You know? And you still own it uh, cooperatively with the other people? Mm hmm. It was the Catalan hippie house. Or Great. Something, yeah. Huh. Huh. Oh, that's and Gabriel, when did you come? Mm -hmm. Uh, I came in uh, 1983. Incidentally, let me tell you to start with, you know, I'm, I'm really hard of hearing, so that <laughs> get the questions to me. <laughs> I'll repeat it. If oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> you came in, but had you been here before? Were you here while Franco was Oh, here? yes. Oh, yes. Well, let's see. I was in Spain for the first time in 1950 because I was a student at the University of Toulouse and uh, came here. See, in relation with my, with my uh, thesis, in a sense, I was learning to speak French and Spanish at the same time because I was in the university there and I was coming here and interviewing people and so on. Uh, yeah, 50 to 52, I saw a good deal of Spain. Then 60 to 62. Then right after Franco's death, I was a visiting professor in uh, the Complutense, and then I came here to live in 1983. And between 52 and 62, what kinds of changes did you see? Well, in 62, things were beginning to be a little bit, a little bit easier. 50 to 52, the country was, you know, there was very little white bread and. Uh, there were this business of people selling one cigarette mm -hmm. was often just a question of poverty. A person could only oh, yes. buy one cigarette. It was mm -hmm. the custom. Yeah. 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 You know. And then by 62, they were beginning to look outward a little more. And... Uh, yes, I, yes, I would say that uh, people weren't uh, the people weren't as afraid anymore. You certainly couldn't talk with people about the Civil War in 1950 unless you were a direct friend just arriving from Paris with a letter to the person you're meeting and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, I had, that's how I had some connections. But that's the only way. I wouldn't start talking to a person in the train or on the bus. Uh, 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 whereas by 62, yeah. There were jokes, there were hints, you know, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when did the tourist boom start? I think that, according to Mishner in Iberia, that's what just opened it up. If the Sueca came down here in her bikini, I mean, it's just... Uh, and then they, yeah. had, they had to be getting ready to get into Europe eventually, although, especially, well, after the Portuguese and Greek dictatorships fell, Spain was the only one left. But you know, I don't. I don't know where. Have you watched uh, yeah. Quentemé Como Paso? A very interesting yeah. TV show that's been on for seven years mm -hmm. about the end of the Franco years and the transition. Huh. Thursday nights on TV One, but huh. it goes through a lot of. Um, mm -hmm. Just when they won Eurovision with, uh, what's it, they, they were just like we. They didn't feel these books about Africa. North Africa, Spain and North Africa on five dollars a day, or Africa begins <laughs> oh, at yes, the Pyrenees. We're just the getting to them, you know. And when, <laughs> when they won Eurovision, it was like recognition of some sort, and I think that's what pushed it. But as far as I was just say, when I came in '69, I was at the I started at the North American Institute where I was for many years, almost immediately. Um, but um, there was no, pol we were told no politics in the classroom, and the, there certainly weren't. We were told, I was just saying, when I first came, I didn't see a police state. 
that I expected, as I had seen in South America, and even Paris sometimes has more police. But they said there were a lot of plain clothes policemen, and in your class, very possibly so. So it's interesting that the, the, during the transition, we interviewed everyone from Fraga to Carrillo, the whole spectrum a few years later, but it was definitely no politics. Women had to wear skirts, men had to wear jackets and ties. Um, there was a mimeograph machine, which was considered very exceptional because that was forbidden, as right. meeting people in groups of more than, do you remember that? Was that three, four, ten? Because if you were meeting, you might be conspiring. You know. yeah. I've just been talking to a few friends, what they remembered. Yeah, yeah uh, so all of that, that's yeah. a difference, come to think of it, for me, between 1950 and 1960. In 1960, I was a member of a Tertulia and people in their 30s, and we talked about the Civil War, too. Now, I'm sure there were no... Uh, they made sure there were no hidden microphones in the room, but there was that difference that. of that. personal ease. Because mm -hmm. in 1950, there's only people that you really knew from somebody you could completely trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even, I mean, when, so you you were in Barcelona pretty quick after you came. You didn't stay in Ibiza then, is that? No, that was just the summer to build the, uh -huh. one month, and then straight to the North American Institute. So, so you also found, I mean, this sort of did you know an atmosphere of fear even in the late '60s when you were here, for that people were reluctant to talk politics or reluctant to talk about these things? Yeah, we only talked with other lefties, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had the feeling too, I remember some of my friends of my parents were in a hotel and they wanted to know about Franco. I said, we better go out on the street. I mean, there was this feeling of just don't <laughs> yeah. say anything. Mm -hmm. Other big thing was the culture, you know, the official culture. I can't remember what newspaper I read, but anyway, there was Ola and Nodo. Do you remember Nodo, the news at the cinema? Oh, yes. Well, I'll tell you, so, the <laughs> only, the only <laughs> newspaper that I read yeah. with any well, confidence well, yeah. was Le Monde. Oh, okay. And if Le Monde didn't arrive, mm, you knew something sorry. important had happened. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh, Anytime oh. the foreign press didn't arrive, it had an article about Spain. Yeah. Wow. The, yeah. the Spanish, the style of, of Ya and the other ABC. newspapers, I don't remember oh, their okay. names yeah. all, the style was very stiff. It just was hard to read for that reason. Mm -hmm. But you needed French newspapers. There weren't many English newspapers. I guess there, too, there's a big difference. Lots of people knew French in mm -hmm. 1950 or 1960. Now it's English, which is the first yeah. foreign language. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, true, yeah. Uh. And then the movies, yeah, there were movies here, but for Easy Rider or anything, Midnight Cowboy, you had to go to... South mm -hmm. of France. We were called the Blue Pilgrims. They even had buses <laughs> taking you up there, hotels or whatever. There was a joke about, did you, did you see the last tango in Paris? No, I saw it in Perpignan. <laughs> Pretty bad movie, actually. <laughs> it's retrospect. Oh. <laughs> but did, I was you saying, go, did you go out to see some movies in Perpignan? Oh, yeah, quite a bit, yeah. yeah. Well, we, I think we drove, yeah. <laughs> and the other going to say, uh, yeah, newspapers, books... Uh, anything about the Civil War? I'm sure Luis bought your book here. There was a place called Ruedo Iberico, at least when we were in Paris. Oh, yes. You would oh, buy, yeah. Yeah. buy the books there. And the, there was always the border crossing. I don't know if you went, because my husband had long hair and a beard, so we, they took everything out of the car. And then even 20 miles later, the Guardia Civil could stop you and yeah. go through the whole act again. But we decided they were mostly looking for Playboy which I think was true, so that they could confiscate, you know. <laughs> Take home. And, that was, yeah. oh. and what else about cult? I don't know. I felt a little frustrated, but we did go to France a lot. We participated in politics there in six hours for Spain, which later became six hours for the Sahara or something, where we met Paco Ibania. Uh -huh. and we went to Sweden the first two summers, so there was a lot of things going on there. but. And I guess everywhere you're busy with life, with your job, raising children, so... Did you have a car? I was pretty happy here. Did you have a car here? Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
I'm not really a driver. There wasn't too much traffic, was there? I assume there was less traffic, less noise. I was talking to a friend today who didn't want to be named. She went on for an hour and a half, and then she called me back. But she said, in the end, with Franco, at least there wasn't so much traffic, and you could take a train south of Barcelona. <laughs> Though she suffered, she said, it just makes me queasy even remembering about it. She had been here 10 years earlier than me, when it was, I think, a bit tougher. Mm -hmm. What else? Did you sign yeah. pi petitions? She said her husband had signed petitions, but nothing happened. Mm. Yeah. They, no, no. I this was I to didn't. save people from being executed. And I said, did you ever yeah. save anyone? Probably not. They went right up to the last minute, yeah. October, no, 75. We were in Minnesota then at a demonstration at the university. Say, you know, I think five people. Right. Anyway, yeah. it was a pretty... Yeah. Well, nine, 1960 was the year when they when they had the first Fulbrights in Spain, mm. and I had the the good luck to have one of those. But I always remember a friend of mine, uh, see if I was Kossoff, who's from uh, Brown University in Rhode Island, and he knew that I was here to write a book about the Republic and so on, so. He used to introduce me to people saying, I want you to meet my friend Gabe Jackson, who's making his last trip to Spain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, were you... This was the book, no? Yes, yes, it, it was, famous, it was yeah. the book, yes. Yeah. <laughs> were you under any kind of supervision or vigilance, do you think? Uh, well, not that I know of. On the contrary, I would say that uh, the more sophisticated people in the foreign ministry and in the police wanted the, an American student to feel that this was a free country. You see, that uh, there was, what do you mean dictatorship? You can see anything you want. And it wasn't absolute, but I worked in the Hemeroteca in Madrid. I saw the entire press, including left and Trotskyite and communist and everything else. The only thing I could not see was the military archives. I went a couple of times to, to I forget the name of the street, it's, it's where there's a public exhibition uh, area now in, in Madrid. But uh, there was a colonel at the desk uh, who, you know, asked me questions and what do you want to do and so on and I remember as I'm as I'm talking to him I'm looking at a picture of Franco with uh, illumination of uh, Christianity oh, yeah. around halo. his head <laughs> yes a halo and a white uniform and so on the Cordillo the was uh, oh yes and the crusade yes that that was all uh, but you know those habits didn't all stop with the end of Franco. Uh, I'd rather not say at the moment who who was interviewing me, but but a high official of the of the Generalitat uh, in the late 1980s didn't like something that I had written in El País, and I had an interview in which. Uh, he did all the talking, and there were two Zbiros uh, right there Henchmen. with him, and so on and so on. This was already in constitutional Spain. That is, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of habits that don't change just because there's a new government. People right. go where the power and the money is, <laughs> yeah, basically. That's right. Right in life, I yeah. was saying yeah. that. Was this because you were defending bilingualism? Uh, yes, yes, that was that was the that was the issue. Yes. When did uh, I, I like to know from both of you? When when did you, I mean? I assume when you first came to Barcelona, uh, the whole Catalanismo was not. I mean, people didn't talk Catalan in public like they didn't talk politics in public. Is how I kind of understood it. Oh, during I, mean, I, would, I wouldn't yeah. say no. People certainly Families spoke did. Catalan. There was no. There was. In fact, I'd say that I'd say that I think that the nationalists have an exaggerated persecution complex on that score. They, nobody stopped you from speaking Catalan. You couldn't you couldn't use it officially, so to speak. Yeah. 
Did, were you so. aware right away pretty much of the whole Catalan question, or you maybe knew about it before you came right away? No, I knew before I came. Actually, it was one of my reasons for settling in Barcelona. I was interested mm -hmm. in the whole question of the nationalism, bilingualism, and what do you do in the schools, and so on and so on. And how about you, Jane? Yeah, no, it was the first language I heard. In Ibiza, they were speaking Catalan, basically. And I was always very interested, and I was very excited that we were going to be able to take courses, and I took several, and uh, went, I think I was, it wasn't a big audience, but I went to every movie they made, La Ciudad Crimada, Zomri <laughs> Serema, to every... Yeah. I always looked for Catalan creation in the theater, not just translations, but anyway. But as it became a little more of an imposition, I sort of feel like if I speak Catalan, then I'm giving in. And then, since this Alfathina de Nuncius Linguisticus is really a bit off-putting, yeah, and... Uh, What's the other called? The fines and the sanctions. Mm. And the fact that somebody can study in French, German, English, Catalan, but not Spanish. And even Japanese. They say, well, if you mm. there's a, the Japanese built a school, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. Huh. I'm glad my children are 28, 26, and 28 and can express themselves very well in Spanish, too. Yeah. Written and re read. Um, what else? Yeah. Um, where, where were you when Franco died, on the day that Franco died? On the day that Franco died, uh, I, was, I was in California uh, at UCSD where I was teaching. Now, a month before Franco died, he almost died. Right. And Many it had times. been announced <laughs> on the radio, and I remember a party that night and lots of champagne. And then it was almost a sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it, anti-climax uh, when he actually did die. Though I must say that I really, the only time in my life that I felt sympathetic to Franco was when these doctors were in, insisting on keeping him alive. And uh, you, you, I had the feeling that his family was so afraid of what might happen after his death that no matter how he felt or, or how little he was really alive, by God, they were going to keep his heart ticking as long as they could. Do you think they chose November 20th to coincide with Primo de Rivera? Well, <laughs> was it Primo de Rivera, no? Yeah, it's a yeah, double. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, well uh, that's, uh, that hadn't occurred to me as a, as a possibility. Where were you, Jim? In Ecuador, yeah. We were on a trip through South America, ready to uncork the champagne for about a month like <laughs> you, yeah. Yes. In Quito, I think. Yeah. But then we came back here in December, 75, and I was very interested in the transition. I started reading Cambio de Fices. I don't know what else we read then. I felt I followed it and understood it quite well, and then in 1995, I bought, bought Victoria Prego's book on the transition. What a thriller, and how little I knew really what went on behind the scenes. With a lot of credit to King Juan Carlos and Adolfo Suarez. My goodness. Yes. Um, just after Franco died, uh, Juan Carlos had an envoy, emissary, friend who went, maybe you know this, no, went to Bucharest via Paris on an unmarked plane to talk to Cesco, how do you pronounce it? Cesco, so, yeah, so, yes. Yeah, to case. get the word to Santiago Carrillo that he was going for democracy. Oh. And if Carrillo would just hold back, you know, be nice, which worked out in the end, yeah. And then he took the big, he had to deal with Arias Navarro for quite a while, who yes. didn't want to go. And then in July 76, he took the risk of appointing Suarez, who had been connected with the movement, and people were skeptical, but he did quite a job. Yeah. I was just skimming the book again. They said the worst part of the transition was the end of January 77, when they shot the labor lawyers in Atocha. Oh, yeah. And there had been two yeah. kidnappings of Oriol and Village Uskeska, killing some policemen, and it was like you know, the bunker, the right wing, was just ready to put a military government in again. And then that spring, they did get the law, reform law through and got rid of the, some of the 
uh, movement laws or whatever, and Suarez met secretly another espionage thing outside Madrid with Carrillo, only three people knew. And then he sent all his ministers on vacation in Semana Santa. The 9th of April, he took the solitary decision yeah, legalized to legalize the, the Communist, Communist Party. Party yeah, in June 15th, there were elections, and UCD got the majority, the Socialists about half, and the Communists, I know it's 9% or 9 votes. So, wow, it, well, but that wasn't the end. No, I mean, as we saw yesterday in the papers about Felipe's 25 years, the transition yes. wasn't over till 82. There were four attempted golpes. I only experienced Tejero because I was pregnant and I had to stay in bed for six months, but it was only five hours of total panic. But also, I was aware of the one on the 27th of October, 82, just the day, before, the day of reflection before the social, the SOE mm -hmm. one. And there are different scenarios on what they were going to do. I always understood mm -hmm. it was Cebrian who stopped it by writing Cronica de un golpe anunciado in El País. But they gave some mm -hmm. other... But anyway, well, Carmen Romero says mm -hmm. there were two other, you know, attempted. Mm -hmm. But supposedly after 82... Um, when Taradeus came back, were you here? I was, uh, oh, I went to meet him, well, not at the airport, at Gran Via in March, yeah, yeah, so kaki, yes. It was very exciting. I just would like, I hope, uh, I'd hate to see Spain falling apart after all they've gone through. You've been, I think, quoted in public saying the 30 best years of Spain's history, you yeah? um, And how about, uh, where were you, Gabriel, on, uh, when, uh, on the, uh, 23rd of February, 81 there. Where were you when that happened? Uh, I, w I, was in, I was in California. A friend of mine sent me the, the photograph on the front page of, of uh, was on the front page of La Vanguardia, of Tejero holding on the, that was pasted on the outside of the lavatory in my apartment in La Jolla. What for a the, number of years, we got over. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't. I wasn't here for the event. I was here when the, when the when the Communist Party was was uh, legalized. Well, and there's another thing on whether this has to do with with Franquismo or the uh, see. There was an agreement made, an important agreement between the University of California and the Complutense to exchange professors for a quarter at a time. And I was over here on that quarter, I guess it was in 1977, I think. When, but uh, I never had any, I never had anything to do with the Complutense. Mm -hmm. Nobody seemed to know what I was here for. Uh, I, I had a, finally had a seminar with, with a half dozen secondary school teachers who were going to get credit for taking work that would improve, but it, it had absolutely nothing to do with the university, whereas the, the, the one who was in La Jolla in my place was in a regular uh, university mm. teaching situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that was in some ways, that was a sort of introduction to a kind of informality or just uh, doing things off the cuff Mm -hmm. uh, my salary was paid, so that part of it was all right. But, but I, I had, I really had almost nothing to do with with the university. Although theoretically, I was there as a visiting professor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I was going to ask you: Were you surprised by Tejero? Did you realize how shaky the? I thought we were just going to jump from Frankel's death to democracy. That's mm -hmm. what Luis had told me. Oh well, I no, no, no. I would. Uh, on the contrary, I was. I'm just sure you, pleased that there was only one such, one such incident. Mm -hmm. It really, really seems to me it 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 was, it was wonderfully managed. And uh, two other people, if I can remember their names, well, the, well, the vice president of the Socialist Party, who was this, Alfonso Guerra, Alfonso Guerra, mm -hmm. and uh, Fernando uh, Abril. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a, a minister. What's his other apellido there? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, those two, see, Fernando uh, Ab Abril was the second, oh God, 
this is where was this in the organization? My, my age and the question no. and names is. <laughs> was but, this the organization anyway, of the anyway, party? Anyway, oh. uh, they say Fernandez and Fernandez Abril, and uh, and the and the second of the Socialist Party were constantly meeting to smooth out things privately that couldn't be done mm -hmm. in the and then Felipe Gonzalez and uh, Adolfo Suarez who were the top men it's it's their immediate assistants uh, who deserve a lot of the credit for our getting the constitution we've got you're not thinking of uh, Fernandez Miranda to court no no he was no, the, no it's not Miranda he drafted the reform law yeah and where were you when you were Pregnant when the, uh, yes, uh-huh, and my, since I couldn't, I was supposed to stay in bed, my mother was here, poor dear, <laughs> and <laughs> stuck here for 40 years, no, fortunately the king came on at midnight, it's called, it was Milan's Bosch, was all, had the tanks yeah. out in Valencia, and was waiting for support, which he was didn't scary, get. wasn't it? it, was really seriously scary. Were you here then? I was here, yeah. yeah. Where were you? I was in Formentera. Oh, you said that before. And, uh, right. When they, when they came, came on the radio in Valencia and said, everybody go back to their homes, these people in the remote, remote place you could imagine, they all, people cried, and they all went home. And I couldn't believe it. I really was shocked. I was really, they did what they were told. They you? did what they were told, and they really thought they'd come back, and you got this sense of, for me, it was a, it gave me a different sense of, what it had been like here than I had had even been here myself in Franco. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. This still carries on a bit, I think. I read recently, either you do nothing, you just accept things that you do nothing, or you get really mad. <laughs> but the idea of being assertive or speaking up for your rights, I mean, I always say just ask, I mean, just in any situation. They can say yes or no, but you know, it's often. No, tu no digas nada. Yeah, I get this from him. <laughs> Did you see in those days, like in the 60s, for instance, when you came in the early 60s, did you see a level of poverty which you don't see on the street today? It may still be here, but I mean, you don't see poverty. Really. Well, it's coming back now. I'd say it's coming it's back, back. But you know. it wasn't nearly as bad in 60 to 62 as it was in 50 to 52. That was poverty that I'd never seen. And I, I don't imagine any young American had seen that much. I mean, the steps of every church, there were a half dozen people and, and people who thought they could, you know, that you looked a little bit sympathetic, they'd follow you in the street and- Beggars, uh, oh, no? Oh boy, it was, Start, yeah, yeah. It was really- In good. downtown Barcelona? Yeah, or certainly so, around Spain, the, the Spanish. visual memory I have right now have, is is of a trip to Seville. And they say the uh, where in the healthcare system, I suppose was not. Oh, and lots of uh, lots lots of people with uh, is it glaucoma? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. eyes. Yeah. Yeah, that was. He was asking about the healthcare system. Very, very yeah. They they hadn't really gotten started. That's one of the. That's one of the ways in which Spain has come a couple of hundred years it's in twenty now, years. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And did you see a lot of poverty when you got here, also? Or? I wasn't overly struck by it. We weren't uh, until we went outside Barcelona. There were certain gypsy areas around Montjuic. I'm trying. I've never been to La Mina yet. Have you guys? Uh, I always was going to take my kids out there when they were complaining about something. You did a story uh, last year. <laughs> where, where was that? La Mina. Oh, oh yeah, right. It's a famous yeah. area, you know. Yeah. But what's interesting is the rest of Spain, which looked so poor 30 or whatever years ago, has really come up. Hmm. Uh, I mean, my husband's just shocked because you want, they, I think the Catalans tend to put down the rest of Spain as poor, you know, but it's... There's a lot of life in Albuquerque. Something I very Europa. much, very yeah. much remember about the appearance mm. of Spain in 1950, 52, especially in Barcelona. It was as if there were just 20 watt bulbs mm -hmm. in, in the street lights. It was really dark. It wasn't quite that dark in Madrid. That's a good comment. Yeah. But on the other hand. Madrid, uh, uh, Barcelona store windows and displays were much more attractive. Mm -hmm. You certainly got the feeling that that uh, 
people have much more aesthetic sense here than they had in Madrid. No, I just, uh, when I was getting married and had never been here, I tried to find newspapers in San Francisco. <laughs> the only thing I came up with was ABC, and the only oh, pictures yeah. of women, they were dressed from head to foot in black, so I thought, <laughs> wow. How about the, I mean, how did you find when you came to Barcelona <laughs> to teach at first year this situation of women? Were women treated as secondary question, yeah. citizens, or...? Uh, no, I was going to say before there was a sense of blackness. People didn't wear colors much. All the school kids wore navy blue. Yeah. And as far as women, I was lucky. I have a very nice liberal husband. But I have women couldn't have. I don't know when this changed. They couldn't have bank accounts in their own names. Uh, they couldn't be out of the if they were out of the home for more than 15 minutes. The husband, in theory, could call the police. I mean, she was supposed to be home wearing a skirt. Um, what else? Catalan women always had more rights, something I respect, and with control of their money, I think. Mm. What do you remember? I was well, just I re what, what I remember actually, mm. especially, I was in Madrid more than in Barcelona mm. that earliest time, 1950 and 51, uh, that women seemed to me more independent than men. Now, maybe there was a certain uh, noblesse oblige on the part even of police and civil guards that, that I, I don't know whether that is is a reason for it but what I thought when I studied especially medieval Spain the fact that Spain had remained a Catholic country because the priests had worked on the women the wives of of the Islamic invaders and so on, but now it's your responsibility to educate the children, so on and so on. And that that gave, because I had this feeling, and I still have it, but it was much more noticeable 50 years ago, that Spanish women seemed to be more independent, more sure of themselves than, than men. Oh, and also I would say that uh, uh, here I was a student in France, which of course was a free country, but still 1950 is just five years after World War II and still memories of the Nazi rule and so on and so on. But that it was much easier to get birth control information in Spain than it was in France. Really? Oh. Now, again, it may have been just the contacts of friends told me what drugstore to go to. To buy the pills. To buy the pills, yeah, so, the yes. Pills. But all those things were available if you knew. moved in the right circles mm -hmm. or knew. And something I always respected is we have our own names in Spain. I think that's so wonderful. Yes. Though it sometimes has confusions. You might have a C for Casada on your DNI without the husband's name. But in France, where I have a son and spend probably a fourth of my life, they insist on calling me Madame Torres Arruga Luis on documents. And I have to go in every time and say Jane Lar. No, I, I reduced everything to Jane Lars. Oh, we could talk about the states too, mm -hmm. and what's happening there. I mean, as far as uh, uh, incipient uh, <laughs> patriot acts, and no, every time I went to the states, I was especially frisked. I don't know if this happened to you. Always In taken. The there was a red spot on my ticket that made this necessary, and part of it I thought was because I had Jane Torres on my American passport. And I finally got oh. that changed in the council without having to go spend six months in Minnesota and go to a judge, which they had told me. But anyway, just this thing of the name in Spain, I'm Jane Larson with my mother's maiden name afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. That's a plus for women, yeah. Good. That's good. Mm -hmm. How are you doing over there? That's good.